a suit and tie And get your hair cut way up high Get yourself a lawyer, son You're gonna need a real good one I've got some lines free and that almost never happens So if you'd like some free legal advice from this very skilled young man, David Whiting, then get on the line, one three hundred triple two seven seven four. You You recoiled when I said the phrase young man. I did indeed. <laughs> I have a certain maturity and you, gravitas about you me. You did indeed. You had a visceral reaction to that. Mm. May I quickly take a moment of your time to clarify a couple of things? Today is technically, I understand, the last day to apply for a postal vote. It is very close to the election, but that's the last day you can apply for a postal vote. Right. I think that, I think the last I heard, I do remember Wednesday being mentioned, and then I think the assumption is that if you if, if you apply by Wednesday, then uh, the AEC is hoping that you'll have your forms by Friday. But um, anyway, that's the application. They, of course, roll in late, and that's fine. They don't have to... They don't have to, you know, be there, um, of course, you know, by Saturday. But must the application must be submitted by 6 p.m. today, Wednesday, 6 p.m. Yeah, the 18th, so tomorrow. So the application must be submitted by 6 p.m. tomorrow for your postal vote. If you've got an elderly relative in aged care, today is the day to absolutely hot foot it. This is well. Um, the AEC mobile polling team attended my mother's aged care facility in Lara back on the 10th of May. Well, wow, I, uh, yeah. I, I would have thought it would be an interesting conflict between AEC and whether or not it's appropriate for them to send people into an aged care facility well, exactly. and what the rules are on the other side. There's going to be all of that kind of drama going on and hence it sounds like, but we'll clarify with the AEC, they're not going into homes this election day. But in any case, do we have any homework? We were homework free, I'm mm, pleased to well, say. That's good, but you've got some homework, you've got a bit of a task coming up. It's Law Week. It is Law Week. Law Week started Monday and runs till next Sunday. Happy Law Week. This year it's been run by Victoria Law Foundation so victorialawfoundation.org.au has a, uh, a stack of uh, events that people can go to uh, and I got an invitation to present at oh. Bayside Library in Sandringham. Oh. The librarian sent me an email and when? said, was I interested? Yeah, tonight at 6.30. So, okay. And there are some seats left, they tell me. Got a book online so at San- Bayside Library. So Bayside Library, Sandringham Public Library. Yes, 6.30 tonight. 6.30. And what are you talking about, David? Uh, well, the... the what we did was uh, we talked about it's it's about this half an hour a week mm. and, and the topic is that it's not all fences and trees. <laughs> yes, it is. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, a lot of it is fences and trees. And I have to say I love those inquiries, so let's get to it. one three hundred triple two seven seven four. 774 Simon in Reservoir, go ahead. Oh, hi, Virginia. How are you going? Well, thank you. Uh, look, I got married about seven weeks ago uh, at a venue. Um, Congratulations. It was great. Thank you. Everything kind of turned out okay. Um, about uh, shortly afterwards, we realised that there was about $2,200 worth of gifts and cash uh, missing um, from the bridal suite uh, at the venue. Um, and so I guess we're wondering, is there a claim to the venue as to who's responsible you, you need to look and see. You'll have a written agreement with the venue and that will specify who's responsible for what. Uh, I suppose you need to ask whether there was a lock on the door, who had the key, who had access. Uh, I, so my, my initial reaction would be they don't have a responsibility. They're, okay. it, they're your gifts for you to take care of. Uh, unless you can point to something whereby they took responsibility, I think it's your issue. Okay. Uh, there was security that were told about the room, but um, they kind of haven't really done their job there. And there is a clause in the contract that says your responsibility for your goods unless you can, you know, unless there's negligence on our part. And that can't be seen as negligence, David? Well, if you've got a venue, we've got, say, two, two people doing security for... Mm. 100 or 120 people in a big room, mm. uh, you have to ask, is it your expectation that there will be somebody sitting and watching the door to the bridal suite? No. Wouldn't have thought so. Simon, was it one of your wedding guests who stole the stuff? Uh, I would say absolutely not. Okay. What was taken? 
Uh, a designer handbag and cash. Oh, wow. How much cash? And that's an unreasonable wedding present, unless the designer handbag was for you, Simon. <laughs> Simon is not complaining about the okay. designer handbag. How much cash, Simon? Uh, I would say... Think about I think about six or seven hundred dollars. Wow. Right, yeah. Oh, I'm sorry about that. So, is that the end of the matter then? Uh, well, why not ask the facility if they have security camera footage about uh, who went no, in and out? There's no CCTV. Oh, no. I, I think you've got to establish an obligation that they were minding your goods, and if you can't, you will not succeed. All right, we'll see if you can establish that. Good luck, Simon, but um, congratulations on getting married nonetheless. Ed in Berwick, go ahead. We're heading your way on Thursday. Good morning. Good morning. Thanks for the call. So I've got another fencing question for you, David, That's in okay. relation to whether, whether rural fencing has the same obligations as suburban fencing. I've got a, uh, a rural 20-acre block which shares a boundary with a neighbour of about 200 metres, and the... Um, it's a bush block. The neighbour doesn't want to contribute at all towards the fence and I want the fence replaced, which is completely decrepit. Um, is there any obligation on the neighbour to contribute towards the cost of the fence? Uh, the neighbour can be forced to contribute to either the cost of repair or the cost of replacement. So get a quote to fix and get a quote to replace. And so it's the same rules? For, well, they're they're the same rules ex fencing. except... The if if you've got the twenty acres and, and your neighbour's got a quarter acre block, the if no, it's he the same wants, size properties. Then the answer would be same rules apply, same standard of fence. And so service fencing notice on him, like you do for suburban houses. Yes, yes, you do. Hopefully, you'll you'll uh, have a different style of fence, post and wire or something. Post and wire, yeah. Rural fence. Yep. Just a okay. standard, yeah, post and wire fence. But yeah, he doesn't want to contribute at all. At all, so he's got no money. Yes, that's lots of people in that category. Yes. Ed, good luck. Hope that's helpful. Uh, Lynn in Casey Fields. Go ahead, Lynn. How can we help? Yes, hi. Thank you very much, David and Virginia, for taking my call. Um, my problem is not really what you would consider a major problem, but to me it's extremely important. Um, I'm a volunteer, or was a volunteer, and I was unfairly terminated from a community choir um, I have taken my case to Human Rights Commission and VCAT because uh, uh, I want to clear my name and my reputation and um, Human Rights Commission said because it was a non-paying organisation they weren't interested. Um, VCAT said because of the way that this particular group was registered they were not interested. I just want to know where I can take my case because um, there's a whole group of people that I used to communicate with and mix with for seven years and enjoy very special times with and um, I am not permitted to do so now. Uh, Lynn, let's be fair to the Human Rights Commission and VCAT. It, they are creatures of statute. They are only allowed to take on um, claims that have been delegated to them by the state government. So VCAT and the Human Rights Commission will have come along and said, we can't deal with your claim. It's not that we don't want it. It's just we're not allowed by law to deal with them. Yes, so, I understood that. They explained that to me and, and I understood that. Oh, OK. Why you just said they rejected. didn't... You said for both of them they didn't want it. They can't well, have well, it. Yeah, yeah, so, well, yeah. So, yeah, Lynn, so, so what, Lynn, can we, what can um, we do? Uh, well, the, the nature of a... a your, I suppose your claim really rests in, a, in an accusation for defamation. And well, that's, well, that's probably correct, yes. But because someone has made a claim about you that you say is untrue. Yes. And therefore you have a claim in defamation. But right. that's a terribly, terribly expensive process mm. that will get you little or no satisfaction. Right, okay. It may end up damaging your would... name further. As, well, a, I thought as, that... as we've seen in some high-profile defamation cases that are running right now, yes. a, great, a, de a great deal gets, gets ventilated. Um, Lynn, can you not maintain friendships with some of the people you were volunteering with outside of the organisation in any case, or do these people want nothing to do with you? No, no. Um, I've actually attended a couple of their functions and um, been very warmly um, greeted and welcomed um, in that particular organisation that I went to. Um, but it was more, um, I was more concerned with um, the accusations being um, withdrawn because it was 
actually quite untrue. The, the, um, let's, the not, let's not go into, let's not go into the details. It, of is it. It, it's not an incorporated association. It's just a group of people yeah. who get together yeah. and sing regularly. Right. If it was an incorporated association, there would be a dispute resolution process you could take to VCAT. Otherwise, you're stuck with the defamation system. Uh, the other thing you might do is work out who it was that decided you were no longer acceptable as a volunteer and wait for them to leave and then try again. Good luck. Going to leave. Ah, uh, well, then it may, may just have to be friendships outside of the outside uh, of that actual. And join another choir. choir. And joining another choir, perhaps. Good luck, Lynn. It, d- it does sound um, like a difficult time that you've gone through. Uh, Lois is calling from Central Victoria. What's happened to you, Lois? Uh, Lois, I just uh, thanks, David, for uh, taking the call. Um, my son, his wife, and their three-month-old twins had a holiday recently in a five-star cabin. I won't say where. Um, they couldn't start the gas log fire, which had a glass front, and they kept texting the owner, and the owner said, look it up on Google. Um, it hasn't been working properly, blah, blah, blah. It actually exploded. My son had his head down trying to look at the ignition um, and had his eyebrows and his um, hair singed. The babies had been moved, luckily, off the couch, the whole thing was covered in glass, the fire brigade were called, yeah. etc. Let's get to your um, question if you can, Lois. Okay, I will. Who's, how can we make these people accountable? Because there's no accountability because no one was hurt. And there is the an accountability. Is- you, I would be talking to whoever re- regulates plumbers uh, and there are rules relating to the keeping and maintenance of gas appliances. They they haven't apl- they they admitted that they haven't had them serviced. It was discontinued, and they knew it didn't work. Oh, now, oh, they... It's the same. That there's, if you like, there's three bits to this. Making sure it doesn't happen again is mm-hmm. to make a complaint to whoever controls gas fitters, and right. just make sure that it is properly updated and maintained. There may be an offence there. Um, I would certainly be asking for my money back. Uh, yep, and I suppose that. you give them a very bad review on TripAdvisor. Yeah. It's very unfortunate because Absolutely. they could have been there. They could, could have, have been, been significantly worse. badly damaged, yes. So is that the end of that then, Dave? Yeah, there's no, there really is. I've got a claim for damages, but I've got no damage. Watch the bad review on TripAdvisor, though. Be careful there because you were mentioning defamation before. Yes. And some people can get very antsy about the reviews that, that are there. So yes. just there's a defamation case running on such a thing at the moment. Really? Yes. About a review on TripAdvisor? Uh, I'm not sure it was TripAdvisor, but it was a review site. Yes. And someone wasn't happy with what was said. So there's a defamation yeah, case be careful there. running through the courts. So the just moment. quickly, advice to Lois about how she should phrase it if she if she uses phrases like, you know, in my experience and, and doesn't actually sort of impute horrible motives to the people, would that be okay? Well, you could, based on what, what uh, Lois has told us, you could say that you were advised that the gas heater hadn't been main, properly maintained, mm. you weren't advised about the, that it had failed, uh, and you were in fact encouraged to use it at circumstances where it wasn't working. But, I, I but Lois, Lois, the last thing you want to do is spend more on a lawyer than you've already wasted on the holiday. Absolutely, absolutely right. So just be careful there. Good luck, Lois. Uh, Judy in Docklands, I think we're up to more burst things. What's going on, Judy? Yes, good morning, David. I am just have a query about burst copper water pipes in a unit in a low-rise strata title apartment block that I have in Melbourne. It's quite an old building, 32 years old. There's um, Mine is in the middle. There's a lower apartment or unit and one above me. And what happened was the lower, the unit below me on the ground floor uh, noticed a water leak. Plumbers were called in. They found the three copper pipes behind her toilet um, internal or external or the wall behind they opened up her toilet but they couldn't find the actual uh, uh, copper pipe Mm -hmm. that was leaking so they isolated the uh, water meters in the basement car park and found that uh, it was my copper pipe that was leaking but the pipes were in the slab of the basement the concrete slab yes so the owners corp are now wanting me to pay the $2,600 $2,600 insurance excess. The owner's corp claimed on insurance, as did the apartment or unit owner downstairs. They want me to pay the excess. I'm wondering if I'm liable, given that the pipes were in the slab of the uh, building, concrete slab. Uh, well, I was going to ask you, Judy, whether, whether the pipe serviced your unit alone, and it does. And I... Th- 
think that's your problem. Had it been a common service, it would have been the responsibility of the owner's corporation, but because it just services your unit, I would be suggesting that it's your issue and the repair is, is for the benefit of your unit. I believe it's your responsibility. Right, even though I couldn't show... Um, I didn't have any... Uh, I didn't breach any duty of care because I couldn't check that my pipes were OK. I, no, I, I, what you, you... There's a pipe that services you. It's a little bit like the gas pipe or the water pipe got destroyed in your front yard or wasted away in your front yard and you didn't know. It's still your issue. It's between right. your meter and your unit. It services just your unit, so it's it runs through common property, but it's your water pipe. It right. just got old. Yes, yes. Your uh, problem. And once you pay the two thousand six hundred, Judy, is that it? Is that all you have to pay? Uh, there are a couple of um, claims from the unit owner downstairs for uh, repairs. Uh, they they put in um, a vermin trap. Um, uh, yeah. So there's so a there claim for repairs, few. right? I'm suggesting yeah. that should still be covered by the insurance that the owners' corporation has over the building. Okay, and so that should that owners' corp insurance should pick up that part of it. Yes. Okay, we'll make sure you're aware of that and uh, make that argument, Judy. Uh, good luck to you, Lisa in Lilydale. Hi, Lisa. How can we help? Uh, good morning. We've purchased a property which is due to settle in about two months' time. At the time of purchase, our solicitor advised us to put a caveat on the property so to protect our interest on that property. The person that we are buying from is now asking us to remove that caveat because he is trying to access bridging finance to purchase a property for himself and has been told that without clear title, he will not have access to that finance. Yeah, I understand that. So what what what, what he's done, Virginia, is, is their vendor has gone around and purchased another property that probably settles before the sale to Lisa. So he yep. he will have he needs to rely upon sure his for? equity in the first property to complete the purchase of the second property. So Lisa, your caveat is quite lawful. It sounds like it's there and it's entitled to be there. It, it's really up to you. Why don't you get your lawyer to ask some more questions about precisely what how much he's spending, and how, so you're really trying to work out. Uh, sorry, has he sought a release of the deposit from the buy place you're buying? The deposit is still in trust and he's pay he tells us he's paid the deposit on the new property in cash from from his own savings. Um, he's trying to tell us there's no risk to us removing that caveat. But uh, Elisa, there, there is a risk. You just need to decide how great the risk is. And if I was acting for you... I too would be reluctant, but I'd really want to know what the numbers were. And and although from a practical point of view, when you get to settlement of your purchase, it's a fair bet that all of the money that goes, the, all of your purchase price mm. will go to the mortgagee. So are you, so to his mortgagee. So let's put some figures on it. Let's assume you're buying for 600, he's, he's buying for 800, uh, he needs all of the money from the his the settlement of his sale, or so he needs all of the money from the equity he's got in his property to complete his purchase. So that's his problem. Yeah. It's entirely up to you what you do with it. I understand the issue. Uh, what you might do is in some way, if you want to help him, you don't have to help him. That then becomes his problem, which will make you very unpopular. Yeah. But you you may yeah. or may not care. What, what, what is the risk to us if we don't remove it? I mean, if, if you, you do if remove you, it. Uh, well, the risk, the risk to you, well, first of all, I would be insisting that the deposit remain in trust until settlement because the last thing you want is to release the deposit and then have the mortgage as well. The, the risk to you is that your settlement doesn't happen. It's a bit of a risk. It is a risk. Yeah. But it, if you make sure that the deposit never leaves the trust account then your risk becomes financial rather... Well, your, your risk is becomes non-financial. Right. What do you think you'll do, um, Lisa? I don't know. We don't want him to lose his deposit or his property that he wants to buy, but we have wanted this property for a very long time. It's a very special property, and we 
we don't want to lose that. So it's a very difficult decision. See how, if you can find out what the numbers are, how much he, how much he's paying and how much he needs to borrow, and that will help you assess whether it's a risk you're prepared to take or not. Can I ask a dumb question, David? How do you get to put a caveat on a property you don't yet own? You, the execution of a contract of sale creates an equitable interest in the purchaser. So if you were to buy a property, you're entitled to lodge a caveat over the title to the property claiming an interest pursuant to an executory contract. And the caveat simply says that? It just says, it says oh, I'm planning to buy or I'm, uh, no, I'm going to be the no, no, purchaser? No, no, I've already bought. I've already entered a contract to buy. Right. So it's the, the extent of prohibition would be absolutely save and expect to accept a transfer to me. Yep. Uh, the grounds of the claim are as purchaser under a contract of sale between the registered proprietor and me dated such and such. And why isn't it enough just to push ahead with the sale as promised? Why do people do this and put a caveat? It's to prevent someone else. It be, it's to prevent... I mean, I'm 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 in the other on the other side of this, Lisa, because this side of Christmas, I acted for someone who discharged her mortgage, uh, went and purchased another property, but to, in order and then sold the first property, yeah. but needed both titles to settle the first property. Yeah. So she went and borrowed money against the property that she had already entered into a contract to sell. Right. And so the. You don't know what effect a new mortgagee on the property is going to have in someone in Lisa's position. Now, on mine, they're both settled, so it's not an issue, but sometimes, sometimes they don't. Thank you. Adam in Armadale. Go ahead, Adam. Uh, yes, good morning. Look, just checking whether um, a wheel that has been homemade, um, a kit that was bought as a news agent mm-hmm. and still there, and then... It was had many alterations, and my father just initialed them, but there was no witnesses yes. that initial, to initial it, right? Yes. And apparently it was presented to, for probate, and that I have seen that invalid, or you know. Uh, Adam, there is a, yeah. there are there's there is the straightforward process where the will is being properly signed and witnessed. And there is a less straightforward process where you make an application to the Supreme Court to say. This is my father's testamentary intentions. It's complete. It's all been done by him. These are the circumstances where, how in which it happened. And you then make an application for the, a judge of the court to admit the will to probate. And is that expensive process? Well, you have to ask yourself, do we all want to accept the will as invalid and therefore we're happy with the an intestacy inheritance provision or do we want the particular form of the will in which case consider it investment if he's right. leaving you a million dollar property uh, uh, Adam under the will no, that, no, that you're not like happy that. with it's no, no it's nothing like that no one's really challenging the will as I said he he made a, a home kit will and uh, he appointed his granddaughter actually to, to well it's, it's it's the granddaughter's issue the granddaughter has to say yeah. Do I think that this is a valid will? And if so, she almost has an obligation to bring it to the attention of the court. Okay. We'll leave it there. And David, great. We'll leave it there. Great to have your help today. My apologies for having that off. And good luck for the talk tonight. I'm looking forward to it. It's 6.30 tonight at the Sandringham Public Library. And because it is Law Week, as David has been saying, we're going to have the Commissioner of IBAC on tomorrow, which will be really fascinating. Fascinating to talk to him about many things, Mr Redlick. So, and he's always a, a very feisty and fierce-minded man. So it'll be wonderful to have that conversation. Tune in for that.